Slavery, throughout its entire existence in the United States, is none other than a most barbarous, unprovoked, and unjustifiable war of one portion of its citizens upon another portion, the only conditions of which are perpetual imprisonment and hopeless servitude or absolute extermination in utter disregard and violation of those eternal and self-evident truths set forth in our Declaration of Independence. John Brown. But was he a madman or a noble martyr, a hero or a villain? One thing that can be said for sure is that in his 59 years of life, John Brown caused a lot. Welcome to Margs and Mayhem, where I tell you a true crime story and we drink. The following content may be disturbing to some. Discretion is advised. If you choose to enjoy one of our themed margaritas, make sure you are of legal drinking age and have fun, but drink responsibly. Molasses is a sugary, thick syrup that was very popular during the 19th century. During the Civil War, it was used as a staple of the diet. Could be mixed into a variety of dishes, although primarily used for sweets, candies, and makes a delicious cookie. For today, we're going to use it in place of our simple syrup in our margarita. So we're gonna take a traditional margarita recipe and just replace the simple syrup with molasses. It's honestly a very similar product, but Simple syrup is made by using sugar and water, and molasses is used by boiling down whatever fruit you have available. So it just has really a different color, but a very similar taste. So for this drink, we took two parts tequila, two parts lime juice, one part of that molasses, and one part triple sec. We're gonna mix all the ingredients together in a shaker with ice, and for this drink especially, we need to shake vigorously to incorporate. Even after I shook it pretty vigorously, there was still some of that molasses left over. So make sure you shake it up really good. Then we'll strain it into a glass with fresh ice and we'll use it salt rim for today. See what I said? Just a different sort of orangey color to our margarita for today. John Brown was born in May 9th, 1800 in Torrington, Connecticut. His father was Owen Brown, and his mother was Ruth Mills Brown. He was the fourth of eight children, so right in the middle, and from an early age was raised with some pretty strict Calvinist beliefs that included the belief that slavery was immoral. The entire family believed that to hold a human being in bondage was a sin against God. When John was five, Owen moved the family to Hudson, Ohio, Hudson, Ohio would become one of the most radically abolitionist areas in the country at one point. John's mother instilled a deep sense of morality in him, and he recalled a story at one point of his mother punishing him severely for stealing from another little girl. John had a very deep respect for women that lasted for his entire life, which was somewhat unusual of the day. His father taught him how to tan hides, and as a child, he was known to tan and make leather out of wolves, dogs, cats, and other animals. He was also known to kill a rattlesnake or two during his day, or at least that's what he says. When John was eight years old, his mother died, and he would never fully recover from her death. John's father, Owen, remarried another woman named Sally Root, and although he respected her, he never grew close to her. What would become a foundational moment for John, when he was 12 years old, he was driving a herd of cattle for a job when he stayed at the home of a man who enslaved a boy that was about the same age as John. While the enslaver was kind with John, he actually witnessed that enslaver beat the young boy with an iron shovel. This, along with several other things within his childhood, would really cement the idea that slavery was an abhorrent institution. It would definitely serve as one of the catalysts for his later mayhem. John was a serious young man who didn't dance or gamble and generally preferred the company of older people to his peers. 
he had an imposing frame. He was very tall with broad shoulders and had deep gray eyes. In 1820, when he was 20 years old, John would marry a young woman named Dianth Lusk. And here's how he would describe her. She was, quote, a remarkably plain, but neat, industrious, and economical girl of excellent character, earnest piety, and practical common sense, end quote. How romantic. In 12 years, they would have seven children, two of which would die young. John was known to be a strict father, like his father, ruling, quote, with a rod in one hand and the Bible in the other, end quote. Foreshadowing. He wanted his children to learn good order and religious practices. His daughter Ruth, however, would describe him as an affectionate father, especially when the children were ill. He would stay up late to care for them. In 1825, John would move his young family to New Richmond, Pennsylvania, as he strongly desired to become of use to enslaved freedom seekers. He purchased 200 acres of land and built a home as well as a tannery there with 18 vats and a barn. Inside that barn, he would build a secret room, which would become an important stop on the Underground Railroad. In the 10 years between 1825 and 1835, that stop would see approximately 2,500 freedom seekers on their way to Canada. Dianth would die as a result of childbirth in 1832 while birthing their seventh child. On July 14, 1833, John would marry 17-year-old Mary Ann Day. She was originally from Washington County, New York, and she was the younger sister of John's at that time housekeeper. The family moved around quite a bit in that area, mostly due to John's financial struggles. It does seem that John was really a wandering man, never really wanting to stay in one place for very long, and he would leave Mary with their soon-to-be 13 children for months at a time while he traveled around, eventually doing his abolitionist things. And yes, if you counted correctly, between his first and second wives, John would have 20 children. I'd say he was pretty prolific in procreation. In 1837, during a Thursday prayer meeting at his congregational church, John Brown would stand up and declare, quote, Here before God, in the presence of these witnesses, from this time I consecrate my life to the destruction of slavery. And that he did. John would meet Frederick Douglass, a famed abolitionist, in 1847. And though John would work to get Frederick to be one of his allies, John really believed that violence was a means that supported the end, while Frederick Douglass, he did not agree with that tactic. In addition, Frederick Douglass had once been enslaved himself, and so things like armed insurrections, that might not go so well for someone who had once been enslaved. In fact, even just being associated with John Brown would get Frederick Douglass into some trouble later on. And Frederick Douglass didn't even do anything. Between 1853 and 1854, five of John's now adult sons moved from Ohio to Kansas. They were Frederick, John Jr., Jason, Owen, and Salmon. Yes, he was named after a fish. John didn't intend to join them, but they wrote to him pleading to bring weapons and himself to fight against these ruffians that had been coming into Kansas. And while John was getting a little bit older, he wasn't really finding the fulfillment in having a family and a career and all of that. He wanted more. So he and his son Oliver hit the road to Kansas. When they arrived, they had 60 cents to their name. But John was a principled man and very persuasive and very charismatic. And soon he'd gathered together a band of brothers, so to speak, around 30 men. And in his camp, he was incredibly disciplined as their leader. He did all of their cooking for them, and they had a prayer at every meal. They ate a lot of molasses on panned bread and drank fresh water from nearby creeks. He lectured them often. 
He didn't want violence except when it was absolutely necessary, and then he was okay with it. He didn't want to be seen like those ruffians from across the Missouri border. He was disciplined, and he wanted his men to be just as disciplined and principled. He once said, quote, I would rather have the smallpox, yellow fever, and cholera all together in my camp than a man without principles. Not exactly sure how um, disease and the principles of your men compare, but that's what he said. John was a man of many words, and he was ready to speak to whoever would listen. Lots of reporters came and stayed with them, and he would talk to them for hours on end, especially about the evils of slavery and what he was willing to do in order to stop it. He fully believed that he would die for the cause of abolishing slavery in the United States, and that would come sooner than I think he even expected it. Now, before we continue, I'd like to do a little reminder of what bleeding Kansas was, because John Brown is fully entrenched in and contributing to the idea of bleeding Kansas. The six years prior to the start of the Civil War were the scene of many violent and bloody conflicts in the state of Kansas over the issue of whether or not Kansas would be a free or a slave state. You see, this was important because there were two senators in the balance that would tip one way or the other depending on the way Kansas went, and that would be what controlled the Senate. Pro-slavery and anti-slavery settlers flooded the state in advance of the ballot, which would determine whether or not the state would become free or slave. On May 21st, 1856, ruffians looted and destroyed part of Lawrence, Kansas, an anti-slavery stronghold. And the next day, on May 22nd, Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner was severely beaten for speaking out on why Kansas should be a free state. In response, John Brown orchestrated and executed the attack on five pro-slavery settlers on Pottawatomie Creek in what is now known as the Pottawatomie Massacre. John's death squad would include several of his sons, sons-in-law, and a couple of other locals. They traveled through the night and rested the following day and then attacked that night at the behest of John. They stopped first at the house of James P. Doyle and pulled James and his adult sons, William and Drury, outside as prisoners. The other son that was 16 years old, John, was spared after his mother begged them to spare his life. The three men were speared to death with broadswords. John would then shoot James in the head to, I guess, make sure he was dead. They then went to the home of Alan Wilkinson and drug him outside, and John ordered his execution by several of his associates. They then crossed the Pottawatomie Creek and approached the house and forced their way into the cabin of James Harris. They forced Harris and two of his house guests, William Sherman and Jerome Glanville, outside for questioning. I guess they were satisfied with Glanville and Harris's answers, so they let them go back into the cabin, but... They led William Sherman to the edge of the creek and hacked him to death with broadswords. They then returned to their company of men on May 25th. John's own son, Jason, was shocked finding out that his father and his siblings had been a part of what had happened at Pottawatomie. John had this to say in response, quote, God is my judge and the people of Kansas will yet justify my course, end quote most of whom could be called the respectable class in Kansas, what, no matter what side they were on, really viewed what John Brown did as reprehensible. Prior to the massacre, there had been eight killings in Kansas as a result of this pro and anti-slavery fight. John Brown had orchestrated the killing of five people in one night. Just a week later, John Brown would lead his small company of men into what would later be called the Battle of Blackjack. Henry Pate and his band of ruffians had been the one that attacked Lawrence in May. And on June 2nd, 1856, John and his men faced Henry and his men in this battle. It was due in part to Henry having captured two of John Brown's sons and taken them as prisoners, I guess. It was a five-hour battle and it went in John's favor after he captured 22 of Henry's men and Henry himself. Um, and... 
Eventually, some people would call this the first official battle of the Civil War because it was the first organized battle that happened. John Brown left Kansas in 1857 with some murder charges haunting him back there. He believed that the fight needed to be taken to the South or what he called Africa. He arrived in Boston and for several months sought the help of private financial backers in order to buy weapons and anything that might be needed for an armed insurrection. He actually was pretty popular amongst the armchair abolitionists on the East Coast, so he did find some financial backers to help him do what he was aiming to do. After he gathered his needed funds, he sort of wandered back to Kansas, despite the fact that his own son, John Jr., warned him against it. He was a wanted man, after all, for what he'd done at Pottawatomi. However, back in this time, photography didn't really exist, and there weren't any known photographs of John Brown, so he traveled back undetected using a variety of fake names. One of the main components to John Brown's idea of leading an uprising in the South was this idea that if he helped to free those enslaved peoples, that they would be quick to pick up arms against their once enslavers. He believed that by doing this, he could really force some states in the South to recognize the freedom of these people. He also hoped to do this with little to no bloodshed, actually. His plan was that enslavers would be taken hostage and people who were not enslaving others would be protected so long as they supported the cause. And he put his eyes on something very specific, a United States armory located at Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. He approached Frederick Douglass and asked him to join. Frederick Douglass believed the plan was suicidal and declined. He asked his friend Harriet Tubman to join. She, luckily, was ill, so also declined. But that didn't stop him. He gathered up his group of very small 21, 21 men and headed to Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. In July of 1859, he arrived and was seeking out what he claimed was some farmland to buy or rent. He did end up renting some farmland from the Kennedy farm and there he started to make his preparations. For several months, they prepared for this attack on the armory at Harper's Ferry. In October of 1859, he and his 21 men filled the backs of wagons with arms and drove to the armory doors where they overtook the guard, Daniel Whelan, and told him, quote, I came here from Kansas and this is a slave state. I want to free all the Negroes in this state. I have possession now of the United States armory. If the citizens interfere with me, I must burn the town and have blood. Not sure who he expected Daniel Whelan to tell this to because Daniel Whelan was a prisoner, but that's what he said. Remember, like I said, the man liked to talk a lot. The next morning, some unsuspecting armory workers headed to work and were captured and taken prisoner. As the townspeople of Harper's Ferry awoke, rumors began to swirl and as can be expected, they were highly exaggerated. It was told that there were hundreds, hundreds of hostages taken at the armory when really it was more like a dozen. A news dispatch from Frederick, Maryland was sent to Baltimore that said there was a formidable abolitionist insurrection taking place and that it appeared that the men would, quote, have their freedom or die in the attempt, end quote. Well, even though John Brown was very organized in the things that he did in Kansas, he didn't really seem to have much idea of what he wanted to do once he took over the armory at Harper's Ferry. He didn't have any idea of what terms it would take to get him to surrender, nor did he even have any real backup plans. It seems like John Brown and his men were not prepared for the organized militias that arrived and some kind of random violence started to take place. John Brown's men just started shooting out on the street at random people and they killed several, including the popular Harper's Ferry mayor, Fontaine Beckham. The commander of the Virginia militia called for John Brown's surrender, but John Brown wanted terms like everyone that was in there would be allowed to go free, and that was not gonna happen. So tired of waiting, the militia just battened down the doors of the armory. 
and in a battle that took less than three minutes, the entire insurrection was over. Certainly going out with a whimper and not a bang, it seems. The attack on Harper's Ferry would be seen as a dress rehearsal for or a tragic prelude to the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln, who was in the middle of his bid for the presidency, was displeased at what John Brown did. He really thought that John Brown would just be seen as a madman and it would reflect poorly on Lincoln's campaign. He was probably right, but after he won the primary election, the general election was a bit of a foregone conclusion anyway. But the whole attack was seen as pretty much a fiasco. Only a few of John Brown's men managed to escape and they were on the run. This idea that formerly enslaved persons would be quick to pick up a weapon, that did not come true at all. And the only free people were really compelled to fight with John. They did not do so willingly. But according to many, John Brown was not crazy. Virginia Governor Henry Wise would say, quote, he is a bundle of the best nerves I ever saw. He is a fanatic, vain and garrulous, but firm, truthful, and intelligent. Crazy or not, John Brown would not be spared a trial. He would go within days. And after less than an hour and a half of deliberations, the jury returned a verdict of guilty to the charges of treason, conspiring and advising with slaves and others to rebel, and first-degree murder. The entire courtroom was silent as the verdict was read. The judge would impose the sentence, execution by hanging, to take place in 30 days. During his 30 days of waiting, he was visited by one very important person in his life, his wife, Mary. On November 30th, she arrived by train. She hadn't seen him very often throughout their entire marriage, but it was clear that the affection they had for each other remained. They talked about their children and their children's lives. In fact, when it was time for Mary to leave, John asked if please, if please she could stay the night. The answer was no. So she left for the last time. December 2nd, 1859 came quickly and the day dawned unseasonably warm. People in the town threw open their windows to cool off their warm houses. Charlestown was the town seven miles away that would see John Brown executed. He asked for no more delay and they did cut the trap door open pretty quickly, but like the executions in the Salem witch trials, the hanging of John Brown was not designed to be a quick death. It did catch him by the neck, but it did not snap it. And he slowly strangled to death over several minutes before his body stopped twitching. The doctors on site pronounced him dead. So what do you think? Was John Brown a hero, a noble martyr, or a madman? Were his actions justified or completely immoral themselves? Was he doing right in the service of freeing enslaved black people in the United States? Or did his one track mind, his singular focus, lead him to make some questionable decisions? Why did he choose to attack a place so well guarded and protected as Harper's Ferry? Did he really believe that one man would be able to end the cursed practice of slavery in the United States? Did he really have such a grandiose sense of self? Several men who witnessed the execution of John Brown would go on to live historical lives of their own. One was the poet Walt Whitman. Another, Thomas Jackson, would later earn the nickname Stonewall. And yet another, John Wilkes Booth, would believe that not only John Brown needed to die, but another man would need to die for the Southern cause. Union soldiers would go into battle during the Civil War, singing words to the tune of what would become the Battle Hymn of the Republic. They were, John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. 
John Brown's body lies a mouldering in the grave. John Brown's body lies a mouldering in the grave. His soul is marching on. Abraham Lincoln would continue to distance himself from the actions of John Brown, but at least John Wilkes Booth didn't buy it. Frederick Douglass would speak at Harper's Ferry in 1881 about John Brown, asking, quote, Did John Brown draw his sword against slavery and thereby lose his life in vain? And to this I answer 10,000 times, no. No man fails or can fail who so grandly gives himself and all he has to a righteous cause, end quote. John Brown is immortalized in the Capitol building of the state of Kansas in a larger-than-life mural entitled Tragic Prelude, which shows him standing in front of pro- and anti-slavery forces fighting against one another, in an image that shows him a little reminiscent of Jesus on the cross, arms outstretched. He's holding a Bible in his left hand and a rifle in his right. Predictably, there's a tornado in the background. For those of you who are music fans, this image is also the cover of the 1974 album entitled Kansas by the band Kansas. If you ask me, John Brown, like any human, was full of complexity, neither fully hero or fully villain. But his intentions were filled with goodness. He believed in social justice and equality of all people no matter their gender or their race. John Brown is celebrated today as an inspiration in the fight for human rights, and I think that's probably a good thing. Thanks for hanging out with me. I hope you enjoyed our foray into a little bit of historical mayhem, and I'm sure you have some strong opinions about the man responsible for it. Why don't you share them? Head over to our social media, Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok. And surprise, we're on Twitter now. I'm actually doing something a little bit different on our Twitter account. Daily on this day in Mayhem history posts. For example, did you know that on this day in 1938, the historic Honeymoon Bridge, which crossed over Niagara Falls from Canada into the United States, collapsed as a result of some errant ice. Luckily, no one was hurt. Head on over to Marks and Mayhem on Twitter for more fun tidbits like that. Uh, I can't say that in all of them no one gets hurt. So if you're counting, that's now Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, and of course, all your favorite podcast listening apps. I'm everywhere. <laughs> and I have some big goals about growing the channel this year on all of our platforms, and I really appreciate all your support in making that happen. For next week's crime, I'm not going to give too much away because it's a short one, which you probably need after all of the episodes from this month. Head out to the store and grab some pomegranate syrup because we're doing a pomegranate margarita because the crime that we're talking about takes place in Florida. And one of the many fruits you can grow there is the pomegranate. I'll see you next week. And remember, there are always alternatives to murder taking an entire armory hostage. John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave, but his soul goes marching on.